Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to The Take-Up. Today, we have episode 22, Developing an Eye for Embroidery. Hey, everybody. Welcome again to The Take-Up. It is Friday. It is a 2.30 p.m. Mountain Time, if you're in the Mountain Time Zone like I am. And uh, you know what? It is uh, the end of a very long week for some of us. I know I've talked to a lot of you today, and what I would like to say is before I get started, um, I am going to say happy Friday, everybody who, who has a Friday, everybody who's working for themselves or uh, doing that hard, hard work that me requires us to work on the weekend. I know sometimes Friday doesn't mean a lot, but happy, fr happy Friday to you anyway. Happy, uh, happy take up to you. I like to have you here, and I'm glad to see everybody. Uh, first thing I'm going to share is actually a personal uh, anecdote. What I want you guys to know, uh, sometimes when people contact me, they're always saying, you know, Eric, whatever you do, you put up there, you, you looks easy. It sounds easy when you describe it, but then I find things hard. I think that there's trouble that I'm having that maybe you're not having or that people don't have besides me. And what I would love to let you know is that everybody has trouble. Everybody has issues. And just to kind of show you a little bit of that today, I wanted to talk to you about what I had happen. Today, in the middle of my work, I was running a design that is eventually going to be part of a giveaway from Brilliance. And I'm actually going to talk about that later on. I'll talk about a little bit about the design itself and about uh, where you can get it if you want to get this design that I'm working on. So I've reworked one of my favorite designs people love out of my catalog uh, so that people don't have a chance for it uh, coming up the 4th of July. But what I'm going to let you know is I ran a sample today and just as badly as if it was my first day embroidering, I had a, a snag that hooked up my fabric uh, and I managed to pop my design out of the hoop on the last color change of the run. So what I would love for you to know is after all these years, after everything you do to prepare, being very careful, knowing what you're doing, it doesn't necessarily mean you're always going to manage not to have problems and that it can happen to me too. So yeah, if you want to know guys, today I had a large long run that died at the very last minute. Uh, it can happen to you. It can happen to anybody. And honestly, what I'd love to tell you is it's not something to get disheartened over. It's something to realize it is a uh, par for the course. If you aren't having problems, if you haven't had something go wrong, if you haven't had a failure in something you've tried, you're probably not trying hard enough. So for everybody who's here, realize that, uh, you know, so the stuff we're going to talk about today, about trying to develop an eye for embroidery, about trying new things, about the difficulties of our medium, uh, that stuff, it goes on for the rest of your career, but it also means that uh, you are doing something. You're reaching out. You're trying harder. If you're not making mistakes, if you're not occasionally ruining a garment, or if you're not occasionally having to uh, entirely rerun your sample, you're probably not trying very hard. And yes, it happens to all of us. So before we get started on developing an eye for embroidery, I would like to go ahead and say thank you and hi to all the people who are jumping in on the comments already. Cindy King out of Texas. Good after Texas noon. <laughs> Good afternoon to you too, Cindy. Glad to see you here. Uh, Sonia says, hi from the East Coast. Hi, Sonia. Glad to see you here as well. Glad to have you in. Uh, Christine says, good afternoon, Eric. Happy Friday. Yes, happy Friday to you, Christine. Happy to have you here as well. Uh, okay, believe it or not, I believe that is my mom, folks. <laughs> my mom's watching the stream. So I'll try and uh, mind my P's and Q's today. And uh, perhaps I will uh, tone down any terrible stories if I have them. So thanks, mom. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mo. Uh, Justin Armenta, digitizer in his own right. Happy whatever day it is. I forget. You know, uh, now in uh, COVID world, that seems to be the case for a lot of folks where we kind of don't know what time it is. That and being an outs uh, outsourced digitizer, I'm sure, Justin, you probably have the uh, problem we talk about the two regular guys all the time that uh, if you're an entrepreneur, if you run your own business, you have the freedom to work the hours you want. Any 24 of them per day you like. Uh, yeah, you probably work all the days and all the hours, and I can say that too. So there we go, folks. Uh, Donna says, hey, thank you, and happy Friday. Thank you for coming in, Donna. Happy to have you here. Frank, thank you for sharing, by the way, Frank, on your group, and thank you for coming in from all the way across the pond in the UK. Uh, and uh, yeah, Cindy, I don't know. I hate it when that happens. You know, so do I. Uh, what I'm going to say, folks, uh, I've got a comment here in from Jeff. Jeff says hello. By the way, Jeff from MNR, glad to see him here. Absolutely happy to see him here. Uh, but what I'm going to say is he can't see other people's comments. You know, it looks to me like we're having some issues with StreamYard today. I can't tell you for sure what's going on. Um, speed seems fine. I don't see any hiccups. But what I can tell you is I'm seeing... Uh, I get to see the viewer counts on this side. And they're dropping on and off in a way that they usually don't do. So I think we might be having some issues with the stream today. Uh, if you're having issues with the stream, 
go to the YouTube. Usually the uh, YouTube is kind of the canonical way, place to go. If you don't know where that's at, uh, my channel on YouTube, if you search for Eric Campbell, Eric with that weird little CH at the end, uh, that's a great place to go get the stream after you're done. Or if you're on Facebook having trouble, go over there or vice versa. Or otherwise, facebook.com slash eric.campbell is where you are on Facebook if you're having trouble on YouTube watching it. So like I said, I don't know exactly what's going on, folks, but if you're having trouble with StreamYard or catching it now, the canonical version exists on YouTube, and I actually go back, and uh, on those videos, since there's a, the ability for me to do so, I'll tend to edit out, the little fl edit out a little bit of the fluff in the front if I've uh, let the title card sit too long, and I tend to go in there and tag these things, so you'll see, folks. Uh, <laughs> it might be that that's just uh, what's going on today is we're having some trouble with the streaming, and I hope not, but it's entirely possible that it is. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and start getting into the topic today. I think it might be a little bit of a lighter topic, maybe not bonus time. I know everybody likes to call bonus time before we even get started. Uh, but with this particular topic, it's something that we've covered over and over in different places. Uh, and what we're talking about is developing an eye for embroidery. And what do I mean by that? The eye for embroidery, as I say it, you know, it's the, the concept of seeing in stitches. It's a way that you start to translate everything you see into the potential for objects that are embroidered. And what do I mean by this? Uh, when we are looking at an image, if we've developed an eye for embroidery, one of the things we manage is that we can see what stitches would be best to fill a space. We can look at the objects that are in front of us and we can start to understand how we would break them apart into individual objects on screen when we're digitizing. Uh, we can see something about what we can intimate with stitches. There are qualities that stitches of embroidery have that can help us to make the best showing out of certain kinds of objects. And we can talk about those kind of qualities that embroidery has and what it can lend. And if we have the eye for embroidery, that eye for embroidery we're developing is an ability to intimate, to understand that when we're looking at a particular kind of image, a particular shape, and up to and including, like I said, graphic stuff, logos, stuff that's geometric that isn't specifically realistic, or stuff that is realistic, a tree, a lion, a crane. I'm going to talk about my famous crane sample uh, today and talk a little bit about that. How would we break it up? Why would we use certain kinds of stitches? What can we do with embroidery specifically to help us render those things in a more pleasing way, a more interesting way, a way that delights our customers and that uh, helps us get a best, the best rendering we can. Also, the eye for embroidery allows us to understand what with our medium we can do to make things more artistic. Let's say we want to add something that does not exist in the piece itself, in the art that's in front of us, or if we need to do something to the rendering, we need to work on a piece that we cannot render in say like a photorealistic way that it might show, we can actually decide on things we want to do to make that rendering interesting or the best rendering it can be, or to make an embroidered piece that is unique, that has its own qualities that make it a piece of embroidered art, not just a representation of what's in front of us. So what, that's what I'm talking about here today. Developing an eye for embroidery is developing a sense of our medium, of the tools in our medium, of the shapes we need to create our finished pieces, and what we can do with our embroidery to make the best rendering. So that's what we're looking for for the eye for embroidery. So whenever I say that, uh, what I'm talking about is we are seeing in stitches. We're looking at the world, and when we look at an image, when we look at a logo, we are starting to parse in our minds what shapes we would fill with what kinds of stitches and why. So I have taught this in many forms, right? So this is this is stuff I've taught when we're talking about, like I've done the demystifying digitizing webinar recently, and that was a piece I've done where I talked about next level stuff, which is trying to add texture, trying to add dimension, breaking things up that way. And I'm gonna cover a little bit of stuff that I cover there. Uh, this is also when we're discussing, hey, functionally, I have to make a border or an object and the pieces that go into it don't seem to work for embroidery. How do I break it up? It's also the stuff we talked about with typography. Typography with text, with fonts, looking at that font, how do I break this thing up to make it make the most sense for embroidery? All of that is encompassed within this. So like I said, it can be both a very long topic or it can be a short topic because I'm going to talk a little bit about how to develop that. And uh, after the week I've had, folks, it's been kind of a, a rough and tumble week. You'll have to forgive me if I'm a little scattered or if I don't get to everything we intend to get to or if I jump around or if it's a short day. This is the kind of thing where I want to leave it open. I want to see your questions. If you have something that you're concerned about or something that you want to talk about or as it comes to 
any part of the interpretation of art into embroidery, please come on. Please jump in with questions, get into those comments, and I'm going to keep referring back to those and take a little Q&A today so you can kind of uh, get a hold of this topic. But to start off, I'm actually going to share with you a little bit from one of my recent webinars. Uh, and we're going to talk over a couple of the topics that are there just to kind of get us started on this process, to get into the idea of what we're doing when we're trying to see in stitches, right? That's developing an eye for embroidery. We want to see in stitches. Uh, what stitch do we use and when things like that. So we're going to go ahead and start there. And by the way, I've got something from Cindy King here. Um, since we're talking about the stitch and artistic designs, could you pick a picture of something for us to practice? Um, you know what? On the fly, I probably can't, but this is something we can do later. And I'll say this, Cindy, this is probably not the last time we're going to talk about this. And it's certainly not the only time or the only segment. This is an overarching kind of group. So I'm going to go ahead and say, uh, for right now, we're not going to do a specific picture that I'm going to pick for you guys. What I will say is if you have something you're working on, any of these topics I'm talking about would work for you. The first thing I'm going to talk about is representing real objects and stitches and seeing them in stitches. So and anything you're working on, you could go take a picture of your car and do it. You could go take a picture of an animal and do it. You could go work on a picture of a statue and do it. It's something I'm going to show you in a moment, an example of that. So it really, um, we can do something like that at some point. But uh, yeah, I don't have something picked right now, Cindy, but definitely want to get there later. By the way, we've got a couple of people chiming in that I want to let people join in on the comments. Mike says, hey, 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 Mike, happy to see you in again today. And uh, Karina Paulson, hi from Norway. Thank you for joining me from Norway. That is awesome, Karina Paulson. Uh, love to have people joining in from all over the world. So here's hoping there's some useful content for you in here today. So let's go ahead and start with this. We're going to go through a couple of these slides that are actually from one of my webinars, one of, one of the webinars that I gave this year, in fact. But I think it's valid. I think it is useful stuff. So when we're talking about seeing in stitches, right, this is what I discussed earlier. We're talking about being able to break an object up into individual portions, into the objects that we're looking for for digitizing. Because if you look at this right here, right? On the left-hand side is a photograph of a crane. On the right-hand side is the final piece that I did. The final piece is made of hundreds of individual objects filled with different kinds of stitches with different setups, with different types of angles and stitch qualities. How did I get there? What stitch do I use and when? How am I breaking it up? Well, that's the thing that we have to look at. What are we going to do to figure out how we need to make those objects? You definitely aren't going to say, okay, most of the crane is yellow, one big giant fill stitch block that's the shape of all the yellow objects. If you're someone who's trying to make something a little bit better, a little different, one big flat fill with one angle is not going to be the way to do it. If we want to get more dimension out of it, if we want to get texture out of it, which is one of the key things we can add with embroidery. In fact, I'm going to jump out, out of the, the slide here for a second just to kind of talk to you. These are the things that are unique about embroidery that we can impart beyond printing. Let's say that our competition, if we want to call it competition, is the printed image, right? The flat printed image. What do we have in embroidery that we don't have in printing? And I'm actually going to jump over to something else to show you something. Well, one of the things we have is texture. We have texture and dimension. Both, as you see in this particular item here, this image has three different versions of the very same file. This file has not been altered whatsoever. And in these three versions of this file, we have very different looks. How do we have these different looks? Well, number one, the first thing I'm going to call out is that this particular file, it could be flat. That could be one fill and one stitch angle from top to bottom, and it would be embroidery. It would be a piece of embroidery that somebody might sell. However, I chose to break this up into individual objects. And as you can see, I have decided, because I have a tubular object that makes sense for it, that the foot will be a satin stitch, that we have the satin stitch for the leg, that we've got a satin for the haunch that's separate from a split satin from the back. There are individual satin columns in the tail that were used to make this look like a digital item made up of individual discrete objects. We have a satin tail here, and you see that the uh, quote unquote feathers, if you wanna call them that, that are in the wing, these pieces of the wing are done in two satin so that we have a nice split line here. Also, if you wanna say it's the beard, the chest, these feathers up here are split into individual satin stitches. Why are we doing this? Because we know that we have the ability for light to reflect off of these stitches and we end up with natural shine and shadow even when we're using a single color of thread. So what do we get from embroidery? What do we have? We have 
texture. We can get that through actually using physical objects and layering, as you see here. We've got things that are on top of other things, literal objects that are sewn on top of objects beneath them, and the occlusion of those objects, the edge gives us a shadow and a shine, a highlight and a depth that we get just, it's like for free, if you want to call it that. You don't have to use shading in different colors to get it when we're using embroidery. So we have that kind of texture, we have depth. We also have sheen. You see these three threads here. On the left-hand side, we have a, a totally matte finish thread. This is a matte polyester. It has a, a ceramic ad additive to it that makes it very matte finish. It's a very uh, intense color, but it's not shiny. It's matte finish, so it's very solid. In the center, we have a standard polyester thread. has a decent amount of sheen to it. It is shiny. On the right-hand side, we have a classic foil-wrapped metallic thread, and that metallic is giving us sparkle as well as shine. But this is the same file. So when we're talking about that, we have specialty threads that can give us differences in sheen. So we have texture, we have depth and dimension, we have sheen, and these are physical objects. Now we can also talk about the way we manipulate these objects. How do we get differences within an object? Well, we have textural differences between satin stitches that are long and unbroken and all line up, so the shadows and the shine are all along the edges. Or we can use a fill stitch or a split satin that has texture in the center of it. So how we break stitches down, the length of a stitch. The longer a stitch is, it is a shinier stitch. It's unbroken, though when we have long stitches, it's very noticeable where the penetration points are. They are very noticeable between long stitches. Or we have short stitches that can look pebbly. They can have more texture. If you have a lot of short stitches in a row, they will look more textured. So we can deal with stitch length. We can deal with pattern in a fill and get texture that way. So these are all things that embroidery specifically has. Then we talk about how do we deal with color saturation. It doesn't always have to be specifically the way we select our colors, our thread colors. We can talk about density. How far apart are objects from each other? How are rows of thread from each other? So in embroidery, we have this ability to use spacing, texture, depth and occlusion, and sheen, sheen is a big deal. The play of light over the embroidery is something that is unique and that makes embroidery this luxury object that you can't discount even in the face of other kinds of printed media. So we'll show you that. Certainly that's what I'm talking about. We talk about the different things we can change that we have control over with embroidery, right? Those are things we're looking for. But the thing is, when we're talking about seeing in stitches, we're gonna go back over to this, seeing in stitches, we have to decide how we're gonna break things up in order to use them. Why do we break an object up? Because why don't I just have one big flat fill that covers all of the yellow area in this crane? Why would I not do that? Because I want to use stitch angles and differ them from objects that are close to each other so that this object has a different apparent color and shine and reflects at a different angle than another object next to it, like the facets on a cut gem. I'm going to use these different objects. What does that mean? That if I want that to happen, even though it looks like one big flat span of yellow, if I have two objects I can make it into and separate them and change the stitch angle from one to the next, change the texture from one to the next, that means they're going to have a different look, a different texture, a different highlight and shadow, depending on the direction of the light as it hits it. What that means is I can take an object, even if it's in, as I showed you here, a single color and get extra texture, extra definition, and extra depth without necessarily having to shade or change the art. That's the thing too. If you look at this piece out here, I haven't changed the outer edge of this silhouette. I haven't changed anything about the art by splitting the individual pieces up. I'm still creating the same shape I would if I made a flat fill out of this piece. But anyway, when we're getting into seeing in stitches, we know that we can make these changes, right? We know we can use stitch angle to change the reflection, the shine, and the direction of that shine. We can change the color, the apparent color, because of that reflection, making something lighter or darker, depending on that angle. Then what we need to say is, all right, I know that I want individual objects. I want separate objects for things. I don't just want a big flat fill of one color from the top to the bottom of an object. How am I gonna decide what to do with that? How am I going to know what stitch do I use and when? How am I going to know how to break things up, right? Well, like I said, the key to this is breaking up structures to make those blocks of stitches. And this is the easy kind of shorthand for it. If you have a real object that's in life that you know what it is, you can actually look at it. We're not talking about geometric stuff or logos yet. We can get into that more. 
it's pretty easy to identify structures that are there. If you're looking at this guy here, this crane, uh, it actually has structures that are present that we can look at in an image. I've got body panels on it. If you can see my cursor here, and I don't know how well you can really see it on, depending on what you're watching on, you've got these flat planes. These are flat body panels here. You have a flat body panel that's here on the side, the door of the crane. Uh, we have in the tires, there's a difference between the tread and the sidewall. The tread has some texture to it and we can maybe change color, but we can also have that be a separate section. Even if we wanted to use one gray across the entirety of the tire, uh, which I actually don't believe it did here, um, you can still decide that I'm going to break up the objects between the sidewall and the tread so that I have two different objects. I can change the stitch angle. I can change the texture between the two as well. The sidewall is a big smooth area. We could use a satin or a split satin for that. Whereas the tread is broken up, it's pebbly. Maybe we're going to use a fill for that and maybe some textural sketching on top of it. Or we'll use a tread pattern or a pattern in the fill to make it even more uh, pattern to have it actually break up. The hydraulic rams that are here, these are nice cylindrical objects. And as we'll cover later, things that are long and narrow and that have a smooth surface that has a shadow and a shine, which you can actually see on this image. A there's a shine at the top and a shadow at the bottom. Those are a natural choice for something like a satin stitch, or if they're really large, for using a curved fill that also has a tendency to show a shadow and shine uh, from side to side. And we can go ahead and use things that are cylindrical like that, fingers on a hand, a pole on a flag. Satin stitches are great for that because they naturally have the shadow and shine of a cylindrical object. Uh, same thing here, we get down to the ridges and the fixtures. I can see these ridges that are on the side of this object here. I can say, well, even if I have a fill for the rest of it, maybe I want a low density satin stitch here so that I can call out that ridge and I can give that satin stitch some underlay so that there's an edge on that satin stitch. I can see a shadow, a physical shadow, even if I decide to outline it or use some other graphical method of calling it out, having that shine or a change in texture between that rail and the side of the crane boom means that I get that extra hint, that facet, that reflection, that shadow that says this is a real physical object and makes the eye track that way. So ridges, fixtures, the rams, the tread, the sidewall, these all make sense. Plus you can think about it right now. It's very easy to, to assume what stitch types we would use. Big flat areas, we already know we generally want to fill them. We want to use a fill stitch, tatami stitch, whatever stitch you your particular software or that you're actually working with. It's going to be a filling stitch, a step stitch of some kind, a seating stitch. This is going to be for big flat body panels, flat areas of color that need to be filled. Uh, the tread and the sidewalls on this thing, like I said, smooth things, cylindrical things, long and narrow objects, small borders, very likely that they're going to be a satin stitch. It makes sense unless we want to knock down that shiny texture on purpose having those as that satin stitch makes the most sense. You get the shine and the shadow on those sides. You get a crown and the edges. Uh, hydraulic rams, like I said, ridges and fixtures, depends on what they are. But in this case, because they are long and narrow, very often you're going to be using a satin stitch of some kind to make that happen. And we can also say, hey, we've got really tiny fine lines, tiny fine lines that are under a millimeter at our finished size. We know we're probably going to want to use straight stitches for those. So we kind of have this library of understanding already. So if we're looking at a logo, if we're looking at an object, we can say, what are the real things in the object we want to represent? What are the qualities they have? How about this? If one of these objects, let's say that you're looking at the side of a truck and it's rusty, Instead of using a regular fill stitch, why don't you use a fill stitch that has some randomness in the stitch links and what you're going to end up with is texture, right? That's, the, that's something that you want and you might want a more organic texture on something that has an organic finish. Uh, trees, leaves, sometimes you'll use a big fill even in a graphical tree and you'll wanna see something that's organic in there and you may actually use some randomness in that fill to get that organic look. And I actually have a really good question right here. And this is something that I wanna talk about later with some of the other examples, but Brian Bailey, uh, creator of Imbrilliance, by the way, and I'm in the Imbrilliance studio, so awesome that he's tuning in. Uh, he says, do you concern yourself about final size of the design at this point? Is it wise to simplify the art first if it's too complex? There's actually two ways to think about this, and I'm going to go ahead and jump in uh, full screen for this. Do I consider f final size? When we're talking about developing an eye for embroidery in general, I'm not always thinking about final size. I'm thinking about relative size uh, in the fact that if we have something that's narrow or border-like, I'm, I'm going to be thinking about satin stitches. If something's big and flat, I might be thinking about it that way as uh, fill stitches. I will kind of think of a general size because in this particular piece, it's a jacket back. I'm going to notice that, I, like I said earlier, those hydraulic rams, they look pretty big. I don't think that a satin stitch is going to work for those because of the size that's there. 
But here's the thing, you don't always have to simplify, you don't always have to work ahead. You can do some of this in embroidery. And in fact, when I worked on this piece, I went straight from the photograph to the finished piece. There was no drawing in between, but that's not always the case. And in fact, Brian brings this point up. It's such a good point. I'm actually going to derail where we were going for a second, at least as far as looking at that particular slide deck. And I'm going to share something else. I'm actually going to share, uh, I'm going to share a, a digitized file. We're going to talk a little bit about actual digitized files to do this. So let's go ahead and pull in something. And I want to talk a little bit about that kind of interpretation, right? And I actually have an example here to show you that I think will bring this stuff kind of home. There are multiple ways you can handle this stuff. Uh, I actually was given, and unfortunately I couldn't find my original artwork on this piece because I had already done some art to work on this. What I had to start from on this particular piece, we're working on a small left chest. And I'll actually show you the final piece. Uh, New Mexico Mining Association, it's a piece that I really love. This is what the final piece ended up being. After we were all done with it, this is what we ended up doing for the final piece. Uh, this sample is rather old. The photograph I had of it is rather old, so it's a little bit lower resolution. You'll have to bear with me. And I think it still looks pretty decent, but the uh, stretching and tearing and the compression on the video probably makes it look a little rougher than it would have been. But here's the thing. I did work on, at size from this piece because I knew I had to have a left chest. I knew that it had to be attached to the text that was in this logo as well. And you can see, you can tell this is an old school design because we have largely lost the swooshes on everything. There was a whole period of time where every design had the swoosh under the text and it was just infuriating and ugly. But luckily, I'm sure that they probably dropped it from their official logo. The thing was, this was a bronze statue that was actually in the front of their building. This is a bronze statue that was part of a memorial they had in the New Mexico Mining Association. And what I chose to do in this particular case was bring this thing in. Sometimes you can simplify. Let's, let's say, like me, at that time, this is a very old piece. I was looking at it and I thought, this is super realistic. I don't know how I'm going to work on it. It's a photograph. The photograph has incredible depth. It has tons of colors. I can't really see where I'm going. So what I did with this piece is I took it into Photoshop and I posterized it. Posterizing reduces the number of colors that are in a design. You can uh, try and smash it down to a couple of colors, a few colors, right? I stopped with that and I looked at it and that didn't really do it for me. I didn't love how it turned out, but then I thought, all right, I'm gonna take the design into Illustrator. I kind of saw how the posterizing worked and I'm just gonna sketch the highlights. I'm gonna look for where the base is. I'm gonna sketch the highlights and that's what this piece is. This piece here is actually my sketch where I decided, I said, all right, um, if I need a highlight, I'm going to have a highlight. So there's a white. I know I was going to outline in black because I, they wanted really deep crease outlines on it. They wanted it to be very detailed. And I knew that I wasn't going to get great detail without doing dark, dark brown or black, something like that that would look pretty deep. And then I thought, you know, I only really want to do two colors. I want a darker bronze or a dark gold and a bright gold. They eventually went to a, a darker bronze color instead of the gold. And uh, originally we're going to have a more golden tone. So I sketched this out. And if you look at this piece, I'm already thinking ahead of time of what kind of design elements I'm going to use. I've got this thumb here, and if I go over to the actual embroidered piece, and you can actually see the stitches here, I realize that I'm like, okay, I've got this hand. What is an arm? An arm is a cylinder. We have a cylindrical shape. It's going to have a bright side and a shadow side, right? We're going to have a shadow. We're going to have a bright side. Well, then I'm going to use satin stitch on that. I'm going to get that shine in the shadow. I've got the thumb as a cylinder. I'm going to get shine and shadow there. The great thing is we're dealing with decreases in the arm on the sleeve. What do we have again? We have a shine on the high side. We have a shadow underneath. I'm going to use overlap satin stitches to make those creases look lively, to make them look like they have that shine to give them dimension. And this is a really early piece of mine. I look at this now and I cringe a little bit. Why do I cringe? Because I use too much fill stitch. I look into the, the legs in the background and I look into the back of the shirt and I used a very standard fill stitch. And if I was doing this again today, I would have used some angled satins of different colors. And even in that darker color, I would have used some of the satins to give me more texture. But in this particular case, I actually, I, I laid back a little bit. I used a fill stitch in that background. And like I said, this piece right here, um, if I'm correct, is probably about 15 years old. This is, uh, this is many, many years ago that I did this piece. Um, and in that case, I, I actually laid back a little bit. I used, uh, in fact, I think the latest version was 15 years old, so it's much older than that now that I think about it. Um, but in this piece, I used too much fill stitch. The fill stitch does do the work, and honestly, the satins that are on top of it do bring out the shine. It does give you some highlights. It doesn't look bad, 
But when I look at it now, I can see how I could have used another set of satin stitches so that I could get that angle and get that shine and that shadow even in the darker color. But you can still see what I'm working with here. The sole of the boot is a thin, narrow object. It's going to make sense as a satin stitch, especially at size. And in this case, we are working at size because we had distinct limitations. We're at a very, very small size for a left chest piece. Uh, but then you see the plate that it's being worked from. Uh, in the this design, I don't believe that I had a curved fill in the software I was working at at the time. So we've got a flat fill here. And even then, you see that it is a flat plane. It is big enough and flat enough that I wanted it to be a regular flat surface. A fill stitch works good for a regular flat surface. Uh, I do look at, like I said, in the back and in the legs, I wish that I had used something different, but I didn't. What I will say is if you see the mustache is made out of a satin stitch, the nose is a satin stitch, the brim of the hat, these things all stand forward. They all have shine and shadow. But then the shading in the hat and the hair done in some, some light manual stitches that don't look that way. And I actually didn't want this to stand up so high. So I actually used a, a more fill-like shading in that hat so that it would lay flat. So it would lay back a little bit. Things that are in satin stitch that have the shine and shadow are going to come forward out of the picture plane. They're going to have dimension. Things that are flat and regular are going to sit back a little bit from the picture plane. They're not going to have the shine and shadow in the same fashion. So in this piece, like I said, very old piece and probably not my favorite piece I've ever done, but I would say it definitely had the same look. Aside from the fact that I still think that the color gamut is a little too far apart, the eventual colors they went with, I think it should have been closer to what we had in this drawing uh, or in my original rendering here even than it ended up on the graphic because I think they went a little too dark with the bronze, a little too high with the highlight. So selecting your colors is still important to this process, but you can see how I decided to break up the objects. I did have a fill stitch, not as happy about that now as I would have, I was back then, but I will still say, if you see these overlapped satins, how they follow the crease, the stitch angle is perpendicular to the crease in the fabric, because if you think about how that fabric gathers, it has that surface, it is convex, it comes out towards you and then folds down just like a satin stitch really is in life. Those stitches come out towards you and then sink back down at the edges, at the penetration points on the edges of the satin. So the object of the satin stitch is very similar to the object I'm trying to represent. And I think that's what's really critical here is when you're thinking about it in the way that we thought about it in that slide. And I'm actually gonna go ahead and pull this screen out and I'm gonna bring that slide screen back so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. Um, I feel like it's the same idea. We're trying to use the quality of the stitches as they are to represent qualities that exist in the actual piece, right? These are, when we're talking about a realistic piece, the idea is we're using the qualities in the stitches, the qualities that the stitches have naturally to help us convey something that is in the actual piece. And this is what we end up with, right? The discrete shapes become embroidery objects that we assess with the proper stitch types. And you can see this, that the big flat areas are nice flat fills. They have an even texture. They don't have extra shine and shadow, but then you have differences in the different pieces. You have satin stitches, you have blocks of fill. And what I'll say is actually in the photograph here, you're not getting a fair shot at seeing those facets in the actual piece. And I think it's actually probably a better example to show this again and say that, okay, yes, this is a, a fanciful object. This is a, a griffin, but a feather is an object, a foot, a claw, the beak of the griffin has a lower half and an upper half. And those objects are being given the shine and the shadow and the depth because the satin stitch represents something very alike to what it would really be. It has that sense of being an object, of being physical. And because embroidery is by its nature a physical thing, it is a physical object with actual dimension, we can use it to represent that stuff. That's what we're trying to develop is a sense for that. So discrete objects, they become objects we can assess for stitch types. And yes, we're gonna talk about finish size and structure, right? The finish size and the structure and the nature of the item depicting will help us decide. So what did I say before? And this is something we've covered before, but we'll go over it briefly. Straight manual stitches are great for fine line work. If we're talking about at size, sub one millimeter, sub actually 0.8 mils, you're definitely gonna be wanting that thing to be a straighter manual stitch to represent it. Fine detail, that's where straight stitches 
are useful. So when we're looking at an object and we see little fine details, we see fine lines, we should be thinking about straight stitches already. That should be in our minds immediately, unless we are very large in scale. If we know we're doing a giant piece, we're doing a jacket back, then the finest lines may be at a scale that they are a millimeter or larger or thicker, and those can then be set in stitches quite readily, right? So manual stitches, we all know, line from point to point can be made into anything you want. Once again, if you look at the tree that's here, those were done in manual stitches for that shading. And in that tree that's in the patch on screen, we actually have another color behind it filled and then just some manual stitches scattered multiple different directions. Stitch angles, stitch lengths are a little more random in that manual scent. It really is great for organic stuff. Why? Because we get some extra texture and variation. Things that are regular look more mechanical and smoother, including a regular tatami fill. Those things look very smooth, very mechanical. When we have a rough fill that has some sort of randomness applied to it, or if we use something manual or loose, we end up getting a sense of something organic. Organic things tend to be a little rougher, tend to not be quite so smooth. Uh, things that are mechanical, that are produced uh, man-made, tend to be smoother and more regular. We can use our patterns to make that happen, right? So straight stitches, as you know, that's it, 0.8 millimeters or less, and that's when we're talking about the size. But really what I wanted you to look at is to think about this. When we're seeing a piece that's made, that's an engraving that has a lot of fine lines or shading or detail, if it looks like the back of a dollar bill, you're going to be looking at using straight and manual stitches. If it has fine detail, fine outlines, the likelihood is you'll use those. It's just how it is. Uh, honestly, talk about the length too. Longer stitches tend to be a little shinier, but the breaks are more noticeable, but smaller stitches, shorter stitches look more pebbled and can look a little more stitchy. Light colors on dark look more stitchy because of the shadows in the stitch penetrations. And what I mean by stitchy is broken. Uh, the reason I say stitchy and I always put little quotes on it is because I hated when a customer would say to me, I don't know, that looks pretty stitchy. And you're like, yeah, it's made out of stitches. It's going to do that, you know. <laughs> but light colors on dark have a tendency to do that more. So it's another thing we can control is our color profile and our contrast, right? Satin stitches. Anything that's like this, it's a border. It is long. It is short like that. Well, we have something that is rectangular. If you have a thin thing that looks like it belongs as a border, satin stitches are natural for that. But here's the thing. You can use them to make texture. This is something I've shown you before, but it's something that I always like to show. You don't have to fill an area with fill stitch. No matter what's there, you don't have to fill an area with fill stitch. And like I said, I wanted to bring over this to split satins or length limit stitches. It's another way to fill in areas in the satin stitch way that is wider or longer, larger areas. But this is the thing. No matter how you arrive at the final shape, the outer edge of a shape doesn't necessarily have to define the way you fill it. We talked about sizes. And we talked about uh, options like that, right? We talked about different ways that you can decide how to fill an area, right? Yes, can, could I fill this area with, in the back of the lion's head with a fill stitch? Yes. And in fact, if someone said to you, uh, anything above about 13 millimeters in width, you should probably fill with a fill stitch. And you took it to heart and you didn't think about the objects or the nature of what you were looking at. Let's say you just measured, you took a ruler to your art and said, okay, well, this is a jacket back design and the back of that area is, is wider than 13 millimeters. I'm definitely gonna render that in a fill stitch. Look what you might've missed if you don't use something like overlapping satin stitches. You have to think about the object you're trying to represent. Uh, for me, I could not bear to have this lion's mane be a big flat blob because I wanted something that would define it, that would give me some shine and dimension, right? Well, here's the thing, that goes with everything. There is no reason you necessarily have to fill any area with one kind of stitches. You can arrive at different ways. The thing is, one kind of stitches will be faster or easier. And honestly, trying to get a bunch of satin stitches to line up perfectly top and bottom and all the edges is a little harder than trying to get a single fill stitch panel to do the same thing. So there are reasons why we use these designs for that. There's reasons why we use uh, different fill stitches or types of filling but you can use anything you want if you're trying to get a specific quality. So the thing you have to remember, the stuff we talked about earlier, the fact that you can get shine and dimension, depth, that we can have layering and occlusion, that we can get texture and sheen. That's the thing, guys. And actually, I'm going to bring this up from Brian because it's uh, perfect. 
Perfect comment here. Uh, seems to me that run satin and fill are analogous to pen, Sharpie and paintbrush. Yes. Yeah, surely, surely. And honestly, the thing to take away from that is not just that, hey, it's pen, Sharpie and paintbrush. It's a fine line, a fat line and uh, filling an area. Not just that, because I would say almost paint roller on in this case. The thing to remember is that no matter that if you wanted to, you could take a ballpoint pen and color a wall as long as you had enough ink or enough ballpoint pens, you could do it. The thing is you would get a different kind of mark and a different kind of texture to the eventual color on that wall than if you used a paint roller. It doesn't mean you couldn't fill the area, right? It doesn't mean you couldn't fill the area. It means that you could have a different kind of texture, a different kind of look, a different way of filling. And that's the thing here. Let's say the satin is the Sharpie in this case. If you fill something, you mark it up with a Sharpie and you cover it over and you get those lines in the areas where some area has two uh, levels or depths of color and some have one, then you're going to end up with something that has variation in the tone. Well, it's the same thing here with the satin stitches filling this area. We have variations in the texture that you won't get from a solid fill stitch. So that's that's the thing to take out of this is that we have the qualities of thread that we can use and no matter how we arrive at what the outer edge of our shape is, we can use the qualities of our stitches and we can use multiple objects to build up the final piece we're looking for. Like I said, you can color a wall with anything. You can fill any area with anything that makes a mark, but the quality of that fill will be different. So by the way, thank you, Brian, because I, I hadn't thought about that ahead of time, but uh, perfect to discuss that. And also it brings up one of my other favorite things. You said the run satin filler, a uh, pen sharpie and paintbrush. Um, this is a lovely little real life thing. If you're ever dealing with a customer who's talking about text and they want to use satin stitch text, classic satin stitch text, and they don't know how big they can go, tell them that they can uh, draw any text they want to with a brand new crayon. Uh, the end of a brand new crayon is about 1.2 millimeters <laughs> when it comes right out of the box from Crayola. And uh, that's about how thin we can run a satin stitch and 40 weight thread reliably. And that's one that just as a joke, you know, hey, we have the uh, pen sharpie and paintbrush. We also have the crayon, folks. So uh, one of the ways to think about tiny satin stitches. But in any case, the quality of the satin stitch, the texture that you're seeing here is what we can use as our paintbrush. In this case, I decided that I wanted ripples and I wanted shine and shadow and I wanted unbroken lengths of stitches, which is why it's called a satin. It's shiny because of the unbroken stitches across the column. That's what we decided to work with, right? So that's how we work. <laughs> By the way, Jeff brings this and I got, I have to call that out. My last customer, I had them use a wide point Sharpie to draw their design. Yeah, no, that's seriously, make them draw it with a fat Sharpie, then they, then you know for sure you can execute it. <laughs> But but in all seriousness, folks, um, satin stitches can be used for anything. And here we have split satins. Split satins, or what I would call it here, this is a length limit stitch. If you were a stitch artist user uh, like I am, and you saw me use a stitch artist earlier, the length limit with an edge pad is a fantastic tool. It means that you can break up the long stitches in the middle so that you don't end up with stitches that are so long that they snag or hook on things. So we're talking about our physical need to see in stitches. Part of the thing we also have to realize is that these are real objects that go on a person. So having super long stitches, once they're over 12.7 millimeters, they're gonna be those really slow, long stitches on your machine, or they might get filtered out depending on how your machine works uh, or what kind of machine you're running. You may wanna break those things up, but you can still get shine and shadow. And this particular piece has those broken up uh, stitches. However, if you look at those big pieces of the acanthus leaves in the back and the florets that are there, it's it, this is modeled after a manuscript, I believe 15th century manuscript, if I'm correct, I might be wrong there. Um, these pieces that are in there, each one of these pieces is made out of a, of a uh, length limit satin column, but it has a length limit stitch and then an edge pad, meaning that we don't have any stitch penetrations right at the edge. So what we get is the edge is very much like a satin stitch, but the center is somewhat like a fill stitch or something of that nature. It's broken up and it allows us to get enough shine, but we still can render strokes that are you know thicker than a centimeter. We can have that for a little bit of random penetration or you can split on texture lines if you want to. But as you can see, we end up getting that satin look with the extra security and less loopiness that you would get from a long satin stitch. 
What I want you guys to think of when we talk about these stitch types, we are developing that palette, like Brian said. We're developing what tools we have to fill a space, how we make a mark. And we can use these to make a mark in a way that we want to, that has the qualities we want. So fill stitches, big wide elements, and also for blending. This big piece here, like I said, great for blending and gradients. You can control things through stitch length, through the pattern of the penetrations. That's how we have control over it. If we use random penetrations, things look organic. If we use regular penetration points, they can look more man-made. If you use uh, longer stitches, it's a little shinier. Shorter stitches, it's a little less shiny to a degree. So roughness, smoothness, all can be in the same fill stitch. We can still play with texture, even with fills. But when we look at this piece, uh, the great thing about fill stitches, we can use them all at a similar angle. And if we match up the way the penetration points go, the patterns, we can get a smoothness to the look that is uh, more like printing. This is actually made up of several layers of each color. We've got three colors in this blend and each one of those colors has four light layers of low density fills that mesh together to make this happen. But why would we use a fill stitch? Like I said, if we know what we want to render, we want it to be flat and smooth, the fill stitch is the way to go. And sometimes even in a smaller point, the same way I said, hey, let's use satin stitches for something that is broader and we overlap them and get ripples. Let's say we have something that's pretty small. Maybe it's not tiny because we don't want to drop a lot of extra little stitch points in something very tiny, very narrow because it's actually just bad to have so many uh, penetration points stacked up or too many short stitches. But let's say we use a fill stitch on something that's narrow and we can actually keep that texture down. We can make something flatter. We don't want the shine that we would get from satin stitches. I've used a fill stitch in a narrow area before. Not too narrow. If you get too small, anything that's gonna be, like I said, a millimeter or less, you really don't wanna use any fills in something really small because if it has to drop a stitch in the middle, it's going to be these little sub millimeter stitches. We don't want a ton of those all stacked together. Uh, and we can end up with weird patterns or it'll just jump right across uh, and we'll end up with a semi satin look to it, which is not really what you're trying to do. But we can use fill stitches because we know that their quality is for them to be smooth, flat, not super shiny. So when we want that in an object, we can use that. That's what we're doing. We're making that kind of mark. And here's the thing, when you put this all together, this is a piece that is uh, rendered from a Viking Age original. The piece I believe was a bronze piece is a plaque. And the original piece was pretty flat. I'm not gonna say it had a lot of a lot going on. It had incised lines on a flat piece of metal, right? But this Viking Age piece, when I rendered the art in multiple stitch types, you can see even though this is one big flat piece, I've decided to render it with more than one color so you get a little bit more extra, you know, there's a little oomph to that contrast that's there. But as you can see in this piece, this color, all this center area, this gold is one thread color. But I have this stitch angle in the curve here. I have a curved stitch here that goes over the neck of the horse. I have another stitch angle in the inside of this leg and in the inside of this leg. And what do we end up with? Like the facets on a cut gem, we have different kinds of reflection because of the angle of the light that's hitting it. As the light comes in, it hits that thread. And depending on what, where the light's coming from, how we're facing the design, we get different colors back. And as you can see, here we have this fill stitch. These are a very similar angle. So they're both kind of the same color. We see this fill stitch in the back half of the body and this small satin that's up on the top by the back of the neck of the horse, by, by the horse's mane. And we have that shine is about the same color. But if you see how we have a uniform shadow on the inner edge of that satin, but we don't have a shadow like that in the fill stitch. Why? The fill stitch doesn't line all the stitches up so the shadows are moved apart. They look a little more regular. Stitch looks a little duller to some degree, and you don't see a sharp defining line of shadow. Whereas we do get that in the main. Why? The stitch penetration points are lined up the shadows in the same area across the entire row of stitches, entire column that we have of satin stitches. And so look at this. This piece, aside from the fact that I'm using a curved fill, there are no special motifs in this. I'm not using any special uh, materials. This is not metallic thread. This is all standard polyester thread. Nothing else about that makes this interesting. All of the texture we're getting is through breaking up this area into different blocks and using different stitch types, angles, and settings. That's it. All the texture we get out of this piece, plus all it uses are these tools, the tools that Brian mentioned, the run, satin, and fill. 
don't get me wrong, I do have a curved fill here and I do love a curved fill for showing something that has volume, like a barrel or the body of an animal where it's something that is dimensional and actually has some volume, right? This is all done with that curved fill. Curved fills are great, but even if you didn't have the curved fill, you could use a straight angle right across this neck here. You could use a different angle across the back of the body and two different angles in the legs and you would still get a tremendous amount of volume and depth Every time a person turns, remember, these things are often going on a garment. The garment's on a human body. A human body is a curved object made mostly of all these cylinders. They're going to be wrapped around that curved object. And as they turn in space, they're going to get these different shines and patterns. And when someone sees the embroidery, what is it going to be? It's going to be rich. It's going to have a sense of that luxurious texture that only embroidery has. That is also what we sell our embroidery on. It's what makes our embroidery valuable and more valuable in my mind than a print. And in fact, hey, if you want to see what's going on now, what people are doing in this kind of new world when they've realized this, there are all these PVC emblems and foil printed emblems that are 3D. Look at the stuff that Stalls is putting out lately. There are people who are figuring this out who don't want to go to the trouble of embroidering. But those of us who know, we have this very this thing that is not only very traditional, it is forward thinking because it has quality, it has depth, it has texture, and we can use our execution of it to change the way it works. This could have been a flat fill. Flat fill, two borders, some straight stitched you know, outlines in the middle, done. All of that body could be one big flat fill of gold and no one would blame you for it. At the same time, how much better does this design look if you break up the individual objects? So when I'm talking about seeing with stitches, I want you to look for the places where you can break an object up. Look for the seams, look for the cracks, the pieces of the body, the panels, the parts that come together to make up the whole of the object you're trying to represent. And like I said, this is not just, it is not just a natural object. And this is the thing, this is why I kind of rail against auto digitizing. I've done this before, so I'm not gonna spend a much time on it, but just look at it, left and right. Would you rather have a piece that was done in one big flat fill or a piece that looks like something realistic, even though it's one color because you broke it up into objects that make sense for the item that you're talking about. And the thing is, this also goes for text. When we're talking about text, when we're talking about fonts. I see so many people who try and take a true type font and fill it, especially when they're first starting. They take a true type font and they fill it from top to bottom and they can't get the text to look the way they want it to. And the problem is they don't think in strokes, right? They don't think about breaking things up. They have this P in one solid stroke or they let something do it automatically and it doesn't look very good. Instead of letting your software do this automatically, don't do it automatically. Think about everything in strokes. And I think the best way to do it is I'm gonna show you this. Um, my favorite way of talking about this, and uh, pardon Images Magazine from the UK for getting their ad in there, folks. <laughs> I'm in there every month, so uh, if you like Images Magazine, I'm happy for you to read them. But this is the thing to think about. Uh, letters in their forms were originally made with a pen. In this case, we're talking about a wide pen, a calligraphic pen. Think in strokes when we're talking about letters, and it's the same thing. Could we fill a letter from top to bottom? And honestly, on a really big letter, if you have a giant C that is going on the back of a, or a B or an A, A has more pieces to it. Hey, you have a giant A that has to go on the back of a jacket and it has to be a foot square. The likelihood is you're gonna fill that thing from top to bottom, put a border on it and call it a day, no problem. But when you're talking about satin stitch lettering that is smaller, that is a normal size to go on a chest or a hat or even a front of a shirt or a jacket back where it's a name across the entirety of the shoulders, you're usually going to use a satin stitch or a length limit stitch with an edge pad or some sort of split satin. Uh, think about the strokes like a calligrapher does. If you look on the bottom is digitized text, on the top is the way a calligrapher would create a chancery calligraphic text, very similar to the font that it eventually became as Zaf Chancery, right? Look at how this is put together. We have the stroke on the top of the A. If this is the first stroke, second stroke, and this one, third stroke, and then fourth, we would do it differently because we're trying to connect things and have the junctions covered. Same thing here, first stroke on the B. Then we have the second stroke that goes up, down and again. Because of the way satin stitches are shaped, we're going to break that up into two strokes between the top curve and the bottom, the top bowl and the bottom bowl. Those arcs are going to be separated. 
But if we understand the nature of the stitch itself, we know what a satin stitch is, we know what it can be, we know what the angles have to look like, and that the standard way to make that work is to break these things up and have the stitch angles be perpendicular to the edges, 90 degrees on both sides as best you can, that we know because we know the smallest statin we can make, the smallest stitch length, the longest stitch length, and we know what they look like, we can break an object up into strokes of satin stitch, right? That's just the way it is. And honestly, a lot of people don't think about breaking things into objects. Just because you have a vector shape, especially if you're importing vector shapes, just because your shape, the outside edge of your shape looks away, or you bring in a piece of art that looks that way, doesn't mean, in fact, it usually isn't the case that your embroidered object should have the same edges as the shape you're trying to create. You should be making things out of individual shapes. And honestly, I may end up in bonus time because I have a little bit more to talk about on this uh, based on some stuff people talked about this week. But I'm gonna bring in a couple of comments while we're here. Uh, number one, Cindy likes the horse design. Thank you, Cindy. <laughs> I like it too. It's a, it's a fun design and I do a uh, weird little Viking Age stuff. The people who know uh, that once upon a time I was a medievalist dealing with uh, pre-Christian Scandinavia to some degree, and also, like I said, Iceland quite a bit, and uh, Anglo-Saxon England. So you'll find that some of my stock designs are weird medieval stuff. But I'm gonna bring a couple other points here. When we're talking about text in the flat fills or automatic satins that don't really look particularly good, uh, Jeff says, uh, I see that often. People auto-digitize text when they try and do a satin over 12 millimeters, wonder why their machine is trimming on each side of the stitch. Yeah. Uh, a lot of machines are set. And in fact, I uh, got a machine in recently that I'm going to start uh, talking about soon, working on a new machine. And it filters stitches by its uh, original default settings. 12.7 millimeters and above, it will filter a stitch or drop a stitch in the middle of it to break it up one way or the other, right? Well, you may have that on your machine. And if you auto digitize, and here's the thing that I'm going to show you, if you're looking at this stroke here, let's say, how is a piece of software supposed to deal with the fact that we have this shape, this junction at the top of this B here? How is it supposed to decide which direction you come in and where do I make that into multiple pieces? Don't let software do that. Decide for yourself where those strokes make sense. Now, if you think about it this way, calligraphically, these people were using what? A wide pen. What is a wide pen? Think about the wide pen. A wide metal pen or a wide quill pen has a line that you're dragging through space. What is that like? A satin stitch. A satin stitch is made up of a line and we're just stacking these little lines together and the little lines become our satin stitch, right? So digitized as it's written with a pen. You can do it very simply. So looking at something like this, calligraphy, and believe me, there are regular serif letter forms that aren't just swooshy, swashy, awesome, you know, calligraphic pieces like this. There are letter forms written with a pen that are like the serif fonts that you know today. So it's not just these, it's text fonts too. Watch, there's a there's a great guy out there, I believe his name is Seb Lester, who does uh, cal uh, calligraphic videos. And he does a lot of them where he'll show you uh, drawing things like uh, the FedEx logo with pens. Uh, you can make any letter form with the wide pens as well. So look at this, this is one of the ways to think about it. It's not exact. Just looking at a calligraphy chart won't show you how to digitize necessarily, but it is a good way to start figuring out how to break things up into shapes. Um, and this, absolutely, Brian, love this comment because I've done the very same thing. Uh, he did a bunch of kanji once, uh, Japanese characters, kanji, and uh, wound up watching Japanese videos teaching how to stroke the characters. Absolutely, you watch somebody doing brush lettering. Today, all of that kind of kitschy, fun, uh, the designs that have the kitschy loopy lettering, you'll see people using brush pens to make that. Watch a video of somebody making those letters with brush pens and it'll help you figure out how to break those strokes up. Absolutely, I think that is absolutely the case. Uh, Mike also jumps in and uh, text digitized as written with a pen is how people are used to seeing it. So it'll look better to them, they won't even know why. Yeah, totally. Think about that. It's because we're looking at it very often as it's left to right. Uh, not always, because sometimes we have to do things re in reverse. Uh, capital K and lowercase k frequently have to be digitized almost as if they're right to left. Though if you have good branching in your software like we do, uh, you don't see that because it, it, it will automatically deal with the occlusion of uh, stitch points so that you can have stitches that are under something stay under. But that's something to think about is that those strokes 
we get this sense of which stroke is in which order and it's pleasing to us because they are literally physically occluded. One stroke is on top of another stroke. So it's closer to us and we get some texture and shadow. Even in this 3D preview, you can see that we're getting shadow and shine and that we have this texture that is pleasing. Also, we get nice smooth edges because a satin stitch has that edge. Uh, <laughs> and Brian says, show of hands, have you digitized this very font? I have. Uh, show of hands, absolutely in several cases. Uh, generally for a logo, a logo type, have I done characters from Zap Chancery, but I don't think I've done uh, this particular font in total. Uh, usually this is one that's in the keyboard font ranks. But it's something to think about, folks. So with that, before we get done here today, since I don't want to go super far into bonus time, I actually want to jump over back to software to show you something else that's interesting when we're talking about breaking things up. I think this is a subject that we're going to do more than once. I always say, hey, this is probably a part one of many. Um, this is absolutely going to be a part one of many situation here too. But I'm going to bring software back up because I want to show you something else that I talked about today. Um, first, one more piece that I really enjoyed. Uh, it was done in a very similar way. And let me go ahead and show you the whole thing. Uh, this was another one of those ones that was done originally from a photograph, but ended up being broken up. Uh, I really do love that posterizing element. Remember I talked earlier about posterizing a photograph and then taking a couple colors out of it and uh, breaking that down. I really do love doing that. And this is another one where um, very early on in my career, very early, somebody brought me a photograph that was incredibly in shadow and wanted me to make a piece out of it. And I really enjoyed making this piece. So I uh, absolutely love that piece. So I, I do like that um, you know, I do like working on that kind of object. So when you're dealing with something that is like that, where you have a low color kind of detailed piece, posterizing it and grabbing a, a darker color and a lighter color that's close to you uh, and having those set up is kind of a cool way to do it. Uh, very much like I showed you with the mining example. But let's go ahead and break out of that. That's not the critical thing. Let's talk about this. And you're going to be like, are you serious, Eric? Really, we're going to talk about the Subway logo. And yes, um, we're going to talk about the Subway logo. Why are we talking about the Subway logo? Uh, because I had somebody in one of our Stitch Artist groups who actually asked about a very similar logo, and they were doing this a different way. The thing is, you could make this logo in a ton of ways. Totally valid. If you wanted to take the Subway logo and put a big green background on it, maybe put a border on the outside edge because you're trying to handle uh, the edges looking nice and clean and then use satin stitches on top of it, you could very well do those these this lettering and satin stitches. The thing is on this particular logo, I had to run it kind of small. This was uh, supposed to stay flat. It was going on a jacket for a chase crew for a balloon team. And I wanted it to be flat and simple and not have big loopy satin stitches that were going to hang up on stuff, right? So I thought, you know, I'm not gonna do a bunch of satin stitches. I'm not gonna worry too much about it though. Let's just handle this in a different way. This one was handled this way. I actually ran fill underneath it and then created the border out of many pieces of satin. So I'm gonna run you through it and just show you. Is this the best way to make this logo? Not necessarily. And in fact, the thing is, I wanted the background to look pretty flat. I didn't want these letters to have the big strokes in them. I didn't want big, giant satin stitches. And neither did the client. The client wanted it to look flat, almost like it was printed. So let's run through the way it was put together. First, we have the white fill. And this is actually centered out. Also, we talked about centering things out. This is tablecloth method centered out. Uh, the shell of this jacket was uh, quilted onto another piece of the jacket. And it was loose. There were two layers. It wasn't actually very much quilted. It was just a two-layer jacket. And it was something that I couldn't take apart, didn't have an access pocket. So smoothing out the, the top of the jacket was also useful. So smoothed out. You're going to see I have a fill there. And then the rest of it, the yellow, filled out. And then we start building the outer border out of different pieces. So what I'm going to do is all of the holes in the lettering, all of the areas that are inside of this main plank, I'm going to use satin stitches on top of the fill. I'm not going to cut out all the fill because a satin satin on top of that fill is uh, not going to cause much trouble with, with uh, density in this particular case, and especially on a big outerwear jacket. I'm not too worried about it. It's strong enough material, even though it was shifting quite a lot, it's strong enough material to hold up to some uh, abuse, right? So what am I going to do between the A and the Y? I've got this shape. I'm going to use a satin stitch and break that up. That's one satin stitch. I'm going to jump in here, jump in and back out. I'm going to use a satin stitch to define the hole in the A. I'm not going to try and cut it out. I don't need to cut it out. That density is not going to cause me that much trouble. Between the W and the A, another satin stitch. Uh, in the bottom base of the W, a satin stitch. In the little crook of the B. And then I'm going to go back and we'll do the top of the W. And now that half is done. Jump back over and I'm going to finish this piece. 
because I want this border to go over that entire piece. I could have done the, the center part at the same time, but I wanted it to uh, actually separate out and make the W look like it was on top and look like I had bordered the W separately. And you're gonna see when I come back. So fill in this little edge, the holes get done in between the W and the B. Now there's the one crook at the top, that aperture of the S, aperture in the back. And now I go up the top here. Why am I doing it this way? Because I'm going to make it look more like I bordered things individually so that the border on sub is one piece. And then the border on way looks like it's on top of it. That way, way looks like it's after sub. So once again, as if we were drawing it left to right, right? Left to right. So that's what we're talking about. And then no, actually, uh, Cindy asks, is the eat fresh and fill stitch? No, this is satin stitches, but as you can see, they're broken up, as I said before. Bottom of the bowl and the A is not the same as that stroke here. The T is made up of three strokes. Uh, the F is three pieces as well. The R, you can see that I actually did it, even though it would have nicely been right to left because that stroke, we like to put that on top. There's a little piece that's done first and then we complete the back spine and then connect up. And it's something we talked about when we talked about running, um, actually running script from right to left. If you were on last week's show where we talked about hat digitizing, part of what we talked about was having to sequence script right to left. Same kind of thing just happened here. I'm running left to right, but because I want that little tab to go underneath the uh, central spine on that R for it to look nice, uh, it does that before it runs the end of it. And then we get the E, the S is one piece, and then the H the same way. So here's the thing, folks. What I'm saying is, is this the right way to do this? Not necessarily. You could have totally made yourself a nice border and a, a plank of fill and then run the subway out of satin stitches. And in fact, I often have. I've done stuff officially for subway multiple times, uh, especially because they were a sponsor of Lynn Fiesta for a while. This is something we did several times. However, this particular piece, I decided to create the voids around the lettering in satin stitches, and it's a viable way to do it. The only reason I show you this is to say that the needs of the embroidered piece can dictate how we choose to break up shapes. If we wanted it to be flatter, this is a way to make it flatter and to have less large loopy satin stitches as part of the design. The needs of the embroidery physically can dictate how we handle the shapes. I could have very easily, and people often do, grabbed this in fill stitches, punched it out of vector, and tried to let fill stitches do what they do. But what you would have seen is a ton of little travel stitches as I'm trying to go all around this fill that has chunks and holes cut out of it, and it would have looked terrible. Somebody would blame software for it. It's not the software. If you have a piece of fill, it starts one place and ends another, and it has a ton of these little cutouts and pieces. The software has to calculate, when do I track out to an edge and come back to a place? How do I find that? And quite frankly, you're going to have to use travel stitches. If I did it manually or allowed the software to do it, if I have a shape, a very complex shape that's filled with holes all in it, I'm going to have to travel between the areas of fill to keep filling in one direction until I end up at the final destination. If I start at one corner and end at another corner, I'm going to have to travel back and forth to get to all these islands of fill that I have to connect because I've got all these little shapes and divots everywhere. Uh, that's one of the things that I could do here too, because of the way I put this piece together. Uh, and this was done actually, uh, what you're looking at it here is being shown in, um, in Brilliant Stitch Artist. But honestly, this is something that you could do in any software. All I'm showing you really is that in the sequence, I decided to make a slab of fill that was not particularly complex. And I did that twice. I've got two slabs of fill, not particularly complex. They're very flat, which is what I wanted them to be. And these aren't perfect. Once again, some of these are fairly early in my career. I show you samples from all over my career of different, and I'll say this is done for one piece. There are things that I wouldn't do for efficiency sake on a thousand or 10,000 or multi years of using the same logo that I might on one piece. Um, the thing is, you can see that I decided how I was going to break up the shapes. I have multiple pieces of satin stitch to make up those borders instead of one piece of fill or instead of one chunk of complex fill. Or in order to not have a complex fill, especially if I'm using satin on top of a normal uh, layer of fairly light fill stitch, 
then I don't have to worry quite so much about it. I'm not going to cut a bunch of little holes out of it. And then I can let the protocol of the fill be very organic. And I don't have a bunch of traveling and puckering and messing around. I have one direction of fill that is fairly smooth and is not going to cause me any issues, right? And I can kind of control the direction of my stitching. So there, the thing to realize is when we're breaking things up, the shape doesn't dictate necessarily what we have, but it does inform us as to what we want to use. The thing to remember is you're trying to develop, what do we call it, right? The eye for embroidery. What does the eye for embroidery normally mean? The eye for embroidery is the ability for you to know what stitches can do. And to use that kind of mark making that you have, all those different tools to make whatever you want, and to be able to do it sensibly for different reasons. If you want to make something artistic and change the texture, you should be able to use the different shapes you need, the different stitch types on those shapes to create that texture. And it doesn't necessarily matter what the shape is that you're filling. You're going to fill the shape the way you need to fill the shape to do what you want it to do, whether that is to have an artistic texture, whether that is to have a flatter texture. Let's say, uh, like I've, I've showed you guys before, I actually have done classes on durable embroidery. And that's so, let's say we're talking about somebody who's working uh, in construction. You don't want to have a lot of long satin stitches because they catch on things and they fray and then the garment looks cruddy, uh, you know, one week into wearing it. Well, we use more fill stitches for those folks. We use more uh, length limit stitches. We use more split satin stitches so that we have shorter stitches that don't hang up on things. If we understand the properties of the stitch, and then we spend time looking in our environments and say, what am I going to do with this image that's in front of me? How can I break it up? What are the different ways that I can make different objects that eventually end up in the silhouette, in the picture, in the object that I need, in the sub object that I need that eventually builds into the entire picture? Stop and think about how you do that. And one of the ways you do that is literally just to spend some time thinking about it. Uh, look at an image, look at an object, look at a logo and think, about how you would want that to be. Think about what kind of objects it would take to build it up. How could you assemble that? And the settings you can use, the types of stitching you can use, all of those things play into that eventual ability for you to have, like I said, this arsenal, this palette of different settings and types and things that you want to use can then be utilized in any type of shape, in any type of configuration that you want in order to make marks. In fact, I'm going to show you a preview of a sample that no one has seen yet, just today. A piece that I did. Now, there is an original piece that I once did that everybody really liked. It was uh, something that I called my USA Trapunto piece, and I only ever made one. And the thing is, we are actually, we're getting ready to do a newsletter for Brilliance. You guys know, like I said, I'm in the Brilliance Studios. And I wanted to make something patriotic for everybody. And I realized that everybody really liked this piece, but I needed to do a modern spin on it. And so I recreated my old USA Trapunto piece, and I'm actually going to show you on screen the sample. I'm going to bring it up right now. There she is, right? Well, what am I using to fill all this space? I'm filling all of this space with straight stitches. And what am I using to make more interest out of it? Texture. You can probably see a little bit of that shadow and that shine. Well, the void that's in that piece on this nice thick piece of uh, essentially this is sweatshirt fleece means that that void, that that void space that's in there has some puff to it because I let that go up. What do stitches do? They tie something down to the stabilizer. They stitch it down because these stitches are the same as the stitches we use for construction. So what is Trapunto? I'm allowing the negative space to puff up. I, so what have I got now? I'm all I'm using is straight stitches. That's all this is. Straight stitches. That's it. That's all we have. Straight stitches. Straight stitches on a, a lofty material and not many of them. This thing is eight and a half by five and a half inches, all that coverage. And I've got about 12,000 stitches in it. And honestly, I could have used less, but I wanted a nice big batch sti uh, back stitched uh, border on the USA, right? So you guys are seeing it here first. This is gonna be something we give away in our newsletter quite shortly. Uh, but the thing is, this is all being done with straight stitches. If someone saw something that was a flag design on a chest, they might think they wanted to use a fill but you wouldn't get this. This looks stitchy and kind of rough and random. Why? Straight stitches. I sketched it out uh, kind of roughly onto a, an area. I had a, a, a simple flag that I made out of blocks. I sketched it out in long straight stitches, point to point across the piece, the different bars that I wanted. And then I jumped back in with a nice 
font, a much more modern font than I used previously. The last time I did this, I used copper plate. Uh, and it's a piece that, like I said, everybody really likes. They love that. You can see that kind of dimension, that puff on that USA, which I, I love that stuff. And it's simple though, right? The thing is, in order to get interest, all you need to do is understand what we have here. We're dealing with a garment. We're dealing with the physical object. The fabric has a quality to it. A thick piece of sweatshirt fleece has loft. What can we do with that? Compress the loft with our stitches, leave some of that loft open. That's trapunto. It's also used on uh, fleeces sometimes or on um, things like toweling. We can use something like that. Embossed work is sometimes what people call it, but really it's debossed. We're shoving down that pile or that loft and we're late letting the rest of it come out. We have texture. We also have the texture of this looking stitchy. What did I talk about with straight stitches? We have the breaks and you can see these breaks in the stitches. It looks stitchy. It has the penetration points visible. So that's something we can do. We can use those penetration points. I'm not fighting the nature of the stitches. I'm using it. If I were trying to make something that was unbroken, someone would look at those stitchy lines and they would hate what I had done. Why? Because they didn't want that broken line. But because I'm using that texture on purpose, I have this cool kind of vintage look that looks distressed and I get it, quote unquote, for free. Why? I'm working with the nature of the stitches. It just looks right because I'm using the nature that is in inherent in the type of stitches I wanted to use in order to get the effect I'm looking for. So I want you to do this. If, you, if there is an assignment, I know Cindy talked about uh, assignment on this one. Uh, by the way, she said, did I put some batting on this new design? This one has a very light layer of batting, yes. I wanted a little bit more, and I'll also say this, I was trying to find really nice thick sweatshirt fleece to run this. I had to go buy some yardage for this, literally uh, uh, did for yesterday. I was trying to buy yardage, and I found out that the yardage I could get was too thin. I do like a thicker sweatshirt for doing this, so I do have a very light layer of batting between the, uh, the backing and the top. So very, very thin layer of batting used for that piece to make it look a little puffy. I like to get that extra puff. Um, but here's the thing, folks. Uh, if you think about what I've done here, it's nothing groundbreaking. It's nothing incredible. Did I design the art? Technically, but really I, I owe a lot to the guy who made the, uh, the font because honestly the letter forms really carry this thing. The sketchy design that I did for the, uh, the, the flag is almost nothing making it rougher on the edges than, than it could have been and maybe overly sweating as a perfectionist to make sure the ends were the way I wanted them. That's about it. The thing is, it's not something that's rocket science. It's not that difficult. It's just using the nature of what you have, the nature of the fabric, the nature of the thread, the nature of the stitch type. And for this piece works very well. And also I've gotten a, a nice vintage piece, low stitch count, high coverage. It fills the needs that I want. And the reason you can do that is because you understand what the stitches do. If someone handed me this, the art for this I created, right? The thing is, if you didn't have it stitchy, if someone just said, I want a flag type design with the USA knocked out of it, if you made a big fill stitch and just knocked it out with vector that was in front of you, which is what I had originally, my fill, my vector, the original vector I had wasn't stitchy like this. It was a full size simplified flag piece that was solid. Um, working from that, you wouldn't get this without thinking about the nature of stitches and what you can do with density, with stitch type, with length and the rest. So ultimately, what I would like you to do, if there's an assignment, I said this earlier, like Cindy talked about, she was talking about, we want an assignment. There is no necessarily assignment that I can give you. The best assignment I can give you is to go out into the world today and every day, go out this weekend. As you're looking around, stop for a moment, focus on something, look at a stop sign and say, how would I make the letters in the stop sign? if I wanted them to be satin stitches. Uh, look at the sign on a bank and do that. Look at a tree or a flower and say, okay, how would I break these petals apart to make them look cool in satin stitches? How would I do it with fill stitches? How would I use straight stitches or manual stitches to shade this or to add some dimension? What if I wanted it to only be an outline design in a single color? What would I do to make it interesting? Think about it. A good portion of all of this is developing stitch consciousness, this idea of what stitches can do, what embroidery can do, and then applying all of these different things it can do to the images that are in front of you. Because this piece, yeah, I did it with the letters USA. Do you think I couldn't have taken a piece of a logo and done this? Of course I could. I could have taken an element from a logo and then made a coordinated patriotic piece for a company. 
just as easy as USA, wouldn't have taken much different work, wouldn't have been mental gymnastics to get it done, but it's something to think about. How do we create marks in the fabric? How do we create our designs? How can we break things up? So with that, folks, let's go ahead and stop this. This is, we are into bonus time, definitely, but let's go ahead and break it down. Uh, if I hadn't stopped to show you that, st that stuff, you know, I thought, <laughs> by the way, this is the one that killed me too. Uh, in that outlining run, the first, the first one popped loose out of the frame. So, uh, I'm glad to have the sample done. <laughs> but let's go ahead and stop there and let's say this, folks. Go out there this weekend, look at different images, look at different logos, uh, look at logos from a movie or TV, look at fake logos, look at real logos, look at different images, look at objects, uh, pieces of home decor, sculptures, and think about how you break them up. Break them up into objects, think. Would I want it shiny? Where would I want shadows? What kind of texture would I want? And think about what you would do. What objects would you make? What stitch types would you use? What angles would you employ to make it happen? And that's how you're gonna develop the eye for embroidery. Also, look at real embroidery. Go find somebody whose embroidery you like. Go find a, a commercial designer and look at the different textures. Go look at a fashion line, like it's super dry or something like that where they do crazy different stuff. Go follow some fashion designers. Look at that too. Look at embroidery and see how people have used stitches to make it happen and then start to let that stuff mingle in your mind, right? What kind of textures are there out there? What are people making out of stuff? What are they using? What kind of materials are out there? And how can I apply those things, those materials, those textures, those stitch types to these objects, these images that I want to create? Go out there, look at it, let it marinate, let it work in your mind. And then when you feel right, make something and share it with everybody, all right? All right, folks. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and leave you on that note. Stay strong, stitch on, develop the eye for embroidery, and take some time to play.